Hi there. I'm calling. Thank you. Which is a This is delightful that we have 60 chairs and we almost have every chair filled. So I'm glad you're excited about weather. Before we go on, one more time, I'd like to have remind you we need to thank the county for letting us use this facility for this month when we're having problems. And I have served the county for coffee this morning. Okay, now, so starting next week, next week we'll be in the CMU Montrose Cascade Hall meeting room. So that's on the corner of South Third and Cascade. So not what you think of as the library and the normal CMU building. It's across the street, see, uh, Cascade Hall. It's in or from the Cascade side and go in and go down the hallway and you're coming in. It's a beautiful new room and we're excited to have it. So find us next week for up there, okay? So, okay, are we ready for Weather 101? Yeah. Just a second. I'm sorry, Jim Park. Is that where the King kids were raised? Yeah. King. No, the King kids were raised over on Townsend. Oh, I Townsend. Okay. He's talking about my family home. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah. When I was born, I lived on uh, Townsend and South Third. Let's go Okay. Yeah, there was a town of about 200 people. And they, and they all had horses and mice. It was a long time before the first stoplight. Please, let me introduce you to you. Um, so you, you have got the write up, you all got the email. We're going to talk about Weather 101. I'm sure that's pretty self explanatory. But let me introduce our two guest speakers. Jeff Colton is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist an incident meteorologist. That's almost scary to say those words, okay? <laughs> Jeff is a Colorado native born on the wrong side of the mountains in the Denver area. He grew up, grew up in a military family and traveled the world as a young server before returning to Colorado during the 1980s. Jeff graduated from Metropolitan State University of Denver with a degree in meteorology in 1992 and immediately entered the workforce as a National Weather Service intern in Cheyenne, Wyoming. 1995, Jeff and his young family moved to Amarillo, Texas. As a general forecaster, and then he made the jump to a senior meteorologist position at the Grand Junction, Colorado office. And she attended the University of South Alabama in Mobile, Alabama, where she received a Bachelor of Science in Meteorology with minors in both mathematics and geography. Yay for mathematics. <laughs> she was a student volunteer at the National Weather Service, NWS office in both Lake Charles and Mobile before starting her professional at NWS career, first as an intern in Grand Junction in 2014 and as a general forecaster 18 months later. Megan has been in love with the weather since seventh grade when she first started, started watching the Local on the eights. That's interesting. I don't know what that is. <laughs> on the Weather Channel before school every morning. She enjoys all aspects of the weather and has been heavily involved with the outreach and decision support services initiatives at the Grand Junction office. Outside of work, she enjoys baking, reading, watching Netflix, and traveling. Please welcome our two guest speakers. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hopefully by the end of this, some of you are gonna laugh. Some of you may cry. But hopefully we all learn a little bit about the weather. So, yeah, my name is Jeff Colton. I've been on the West Slope for 20 years now. Did grow up on another side. Um, we don't like talking about it too much. But, and we're not talking about the Broncos today. Yeah, right down here a little bit. Megan might want to bring it up. She's a big sports fan, so we'll see where we go. We're going to jump through this. We've got a lot of slides. We're going to do it pretty fast. We're fast talkers. We're weathermen. We're weather women. We're weather people. 
So our agenda today, we have an introduction. We're going through that now, forecasting 101, what type of hazardous weather um, we can expect. A little bit about situational awareness when you're out there observing the sky. Talk about watches and warnings and our winter outlook for this upcoming winter season. Because I know everyone is ready to hear what we have to say. <laughs> See, you laugh. All right, slide one. So what do we do at the National Weather Service? Right now, we are up in the Grand Junction, Colorado area. We're right by the radar tower. We issue forecasts for all of Western Colorado and Eastern Utah. So basically from the Continental Divide, in the easternmost counties of Utah. So we covered Moab, Mexican Hat, Utah, Cortez, all the way up to Steamboat Springs. And we have some haters down in Durango that don't love us too much, but we, we're working through that problem. Um, we issue a lot of graphical forecasts and dissemination, so if you visit our website or you follow us on Facebook or Twitter, you'll, you'll see our graphics and how we disseminate the forecast. We work with partners, local partners, emergency managers, uh, fire departments, sheriff's departments, uh, forest service, those types of partner support. We work with the public. So if anyone needs any information on weather, they can call us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We launch weather balloons twice a day. We offer people to come out and help us at 5 a.m. No one's ever taken us up on that. <laughs> we do that and we issue all the watches, warnings, and advisories. So the National Weather Service has the sole responsibility of issuing watches and warnings for the entire country. So if there's a severe thunderstorm warning or a winter storm warning, that's coming out of the National Weather Service office. If it's not coming from there, it's not real. So just make sure your source of information is correct. So what goes into a forecast? There's a lot of things going into the forecast. One of the big, big parts of our, our uh, job is looking at computer models, weather models, numerical weather forecasting. We collect observations. What are observations? Those are temp uh, measurements of wind speed, relative humidity, temperatures, uh, wind direction, barometric pressure. So we have tools to do that. And local expertise. So that's the, the old timers in the office, the guys that have been there for a while. You build up experience over the years, so you start to recognize weather patterns. And as we bring newer people in, we have to share that knowledge and spread that down. So it's an effort. And for the really strong forecasters, they'll actually get out in the community and talk to old timers themselves. You get to talk to the farmers and ranchers, and those that have been out in the, the West Slope forever. And that's, as an incident meteorologist, when I'm going on wildfires, I sometimes, like last year I was in Washington State, near the Canadian border. I didn't know the weather patterns up there. So I went and found locals that explained how the weather worked there. And that helped me generate my forecast. So here's that numerical weather prediction. Fun stuff. This is the math. Every forecaster goes through this. So can anyone tell me what these equations mean? <laughs> the quasi-geostrophic omega equation? Yes, we had to learn this. We had to understand how these formulas work, the friction effects, this helped us determine weather patterns. This is where the computer models are generating all the information. So all those observations we're collecting provide pieces of the puzzle that we use to generate our computer models. The data is interpolated and processed by supercomputers. We can't do that with a laptop. We have a bank of computers in Washington, D.C. that run on things called teraflops and way, way bigger and faster. So to prove that we actually do take these classes, here's some handwritten notes. <laughs> so we start with the QG tendency and, you know, QG vorticity, want to get rid of the X term, blah, 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 blah. So there will be a test at the end of this, and hopefully you remember this equation. We'll go through that. So there's two main types of, of weather predictions, long-range forecasting. So that's looking at the global system. We're looking five, 10 days out, or even further out. Uh, we have a couple computer systems that I know everyone's heard of. The European model, and the global model, the American model. <coughs> So these are the two big things, big difference between them. One's made in Europe, one's made in America. And the, and the European model actually has more uh, supercomputer 
capabilities, so they have more of those teraflops available to run things, so they run a little bit faster. But our, we're finding that they vary by storm. So now we run multiple versions of these models, and they're called ensembles, and we put them all together. So we have a wide range of forecasts, and the computers will generate a best forecast, and the forecasters will actually go in and work from there. We have short range modeling. These are higher resolution models over the next few hours, out to maybe 24, 36 hours. These are the brand new computer models. They're called the mesoscale modeling, where we're actually watching thunderstorms develop over terrain. Like the Uncompahgre Plateau, we'll see thunderstorms developing near Escalante Forks, because that's where they always develop out there. And then they move east, and they fall apart as they come off. But our high resolution models are actually picking this up now, so we're able to time some of these storms coming off the higher terrain and whether they'll live to see Montrose or they'll dissipate before they get here. So we're improving that short range modeling as well at this time. This is an example of the jet stream in one of the computer models. So we're launching weather balloons all across the nation. They're going up and they're collecting all that data and going to the Q QG modeling, and we're getting measurements of wind speeds. This is just an example of a strong winds aloft. That's kind of steering our weather patterns. This is an example of the weather at about 19,000 feet, 18,000 feet roughly. So it's above mountaintop levels, but all those yellow, yellow areas and oranges, it's kind of signifying areas where the air is moving upwards or lift. And that's what we're looking at for generation of uh, rain or snow or thunderstorms. So then as we move down in the atmosphere, this is right at mountaintop over around 10,000 feet. This is the uh, temperatures. Obviously temperatures as you go higher up the atmosphere, cooler, lower, but this is kind of a flat plane. This gives us an indication where our cold fronts and things that will impact the west slope are. And finally, this is a surface map. So this is just basically what's happening on the ground. You see the green colors? That's the area where the computer model is forecasting rainfall. The brighter yellows are where it's forecasting um, thunderstorm activity or heavier rain. The blues, what do you think that's? Six times. Snow. Snow. How about those pinks? Ice. 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 Baby, yes. That's it. <laughs> so I'm going to pass the baton to Megan for a few minutes huh? so I can take a break. <laughs> so next up, talking about observations. So a lot of observations go into the weather. Um, and we're talking about adding new ones all the time. In the future, in addition to this list, we could see you know road temperatures. We could see hard temperatures. We could see more plane observations. I mean, there's just so much uh, potential and possibilities with observations. But um, like Jeff mentioned, we have the weather balloon. So that's twice a day that we launch at our office. There's a picture on the next slide that will show. Um, so we have the weather balloon that goes into the atmosphere and collects um, temperature and dew point and humidity and um, wind speed and all that good stuff. We also have the surface observations. Um, we'll show some instruments as well with that, um, looking at the sea surface temperature. Um, and then finally, the real-time forecasting that's getting the latest information, which is satellite and radar and um, other kind of ground observations that we have, like the automated weather stations. So this is a picture of our weather balloon. So this is one of our forecasters at the office. So we're located right next to the Grand Junction um, Airport. Mm -hmm. And so this big weather balloon is about like six, seven feet wide in diameter when we send it up. And as it goes up in the atmosphere, um, with decreasing pressure, it expands. And by the time it pops, it gets about the size of a school bus. So they get pretty big. <laughs> and um, there's actually really cool videos online that you guys can look up about weather balloons popping when they get up there. Um, and we have a little parachute that's attached to it, and this little instrument is called the radio song. So that's what's collecting that temperature and dew point, all that good stuff. And um, we actually just converted ours from helium to hydrogen, so we're now filling these ones with hydrogen. We have a nice little warning tag that, hey, this is hydrogen, <laughs> don't touch it. Um, but yeah, it goes up twice a day. Um, you guys are more than welcome to come see it, it's really awesome. But this is really important information for determining where the jet stream is setting up, like Jeff was mentioning. So. This is really crucial. Um, there's probably maybe what, like 80 offices across the United States that send these up twice a day at the same time. And we're all getting that information in. They can do special launches whenever there's um, severe weather events. They do this all the time in the plane. They get um, 
such observations to see what the latest is. So weather balloons are really crucial information. They're really important. Next up, we have um, these are kind of the ground observations. This is our it's called ASOS. We like our acronyms in the Weather Service. But it's basically um, the automated surface ob observing observation system. And these are set up at different airports. We have one at Montrose as well. And we have this little sensor. It collects, again, the temperature, dew point, humidity, all this good stuff that we need to know what's happening at the airports. And then we have, um, you guys are probably most familiar with uh, the real-time observations with you know, the radar and the satellite. So as you guys heard, but we recently got some new improvements with our satellites over the last couple of years. We've had this new, um, new satellites being sent up um, in the last two years. And these satellites are really awesome. You can just see the comparison. So on the, you guys are right, um, you can see our old satellite compared to what we have now. And you're gonna see it, the clarity is much better. The resolution's really awesome. But it just, it looks like this is basically a snapshot of the Earth. It's really cool. We geek out about this so much in our office. Um, and a cool thing that we can do with this satellite, there's so many capabilities, but this is just one of them. Um, so looking at this loop, if you guys look right here, it's always really fun asking kids on school tours what they think this is. They think it's like volcanoes and stuff. <laughs> but um, this is actually a, um, a smoke plume from a fire. So um, we can use this. We can get one minute satellite data. It's really awesome. We can just see these kind of, like this is the resolution we can see in our area. We can see these wildfires going up. Actually with the, uh, the 416 fire, I was working that day that it went off and we could see the smoke plume on satellite and we called, uh, we called them to the dispatch office where like we see this fire. So it's really great for notifying the dispatch about when new wildfires have started. So again, it's super easy to geek out over this. <laughs> and um, another cool thing with satellite, this is just the eye of a hurricane. So really impressive um, clarity, resolution, again, super easy to geek out over. And those, um, those little black pixels, when they first sent the satellite up, they were um, having some like data interpretation issues, but um, it's all fixed now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we love the satellite. And next, I'm talking about radar. Megan doesn't like these slides. <laughs> so the National Weather Service has, uh, has Doppler radars deployed across the entire country. As you can see in the west, there's a lot of gaps, a lot of holes. So that's one of our challenges in the West because mountains are blocking the radar beam a lot. Our radar is at 10,000 feet. And the next slide will kind of show what we're, we're faced with. Our radar is on top of the Grand Mesa. So that's just east of Grand Junction. But to the Southwest, these mountains are blocking the lower part of our radar beam. So we get this pie wedge here. And you'll see that on our radar display a lot. We're, I think that's the next slide where you can see near Delta, Cedar Edge, Hotchkiss, how there's this, this wedge. We can get around that by moving the elevation beam up a little bit so we can see, but we're missing some of the important details in the lower levels of the atmosphere. So there's some work being done to potentially lower <coughs> our elevation scan to allow us to see further out in the distance and time that will improve this radar capability, but it's not gonna help us in this wedge just because we can't move those mountains. We can try, <laughs> it's a lot of work. But our radar it takes our electronics technicians 45 minutes to go from our office to our garage on the Grand Mesa. Then they hop on snowmobiles and they ride on snowmobiles for another 15 to 17 miles just to get to the radar. And when they take the snowcat, the snowcat travels at a mass speed of like five to 10 miles an hour. So it takes a long time to get up there and work on that radar. And these guys are all winter survival trained. They're, they can stay up there on the Mesa for a week if they have to. We have supplies up there for them. So. Pretty cool, something we definitely need. Localized experience, like I said earlier, this is one of our big parts that we need. All the models and observation, the cool imagery are great, but if we don't have someone in the office to tie all that stuff together and bring it to presented in a way that everyone understands what good is it. So that's why that local expertise is very uh, important. The longer a person's in a, a spot, the better acclimated they're gonna get to that weather. So it's very important that we keep that going and presenting that information in an easy <coughs> manner. So types of hazardous weather in Colorado and Eastern Utah. Flash flooding is probably our biggest threat out here. 
followed by winter weather, fire weather, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, and yes, hurricanes. We'll explain that a little bit later in the show. But um, up in the top right, that's a shelf cloud near Monticello. A shelf cloud is just an area of downward momentum, air coming at us, so strong winds would be expected with that. Hello? <laughs> so tornado near Steamo Springs, that was in 2018. We actually did find evidence that it did touch the ground. So that, that rumor that tornadoes don't occur in Western Colorado is a false rumor, they do happen. Don't happen very often, we average about one a year. And then the Arch Canyon flash flood in 2015, sweeping SUVs down a normally dry wash. Well, it wasn't so dry that day, and they didn't anticipate they were gonna get swept away. All right, now the show gets really fun. You guys ready? All right, so this is a, don't do this. situational awareness thing I talked about earlier we're going to talk about that some more but it's obviously he wasn't he didn't understand this road system he was on he wasn't anticipating a river being across his road his path so I wouldn't encourage you even if he did know it was there he probably would have tried to drive across the anyway because that's what guys do and <laughs> he probably would have got swept out so. so this is in Utah I believe we edited out all the bad words. So. <laughs> but the, fasc the fascinating thing about this is you can see buckets, plastic buckets floating down, so it's, it's really crazy, the human influence. So this is a mudslide. So the power of Mother Nature, and, and a lot of this stuff is happening from thunderstorms that are 20, 30 miles away. They're dropping all the rain, and all that's falling, moving downhill. And these landslides, mudslides, they can, they're oxygen very destructive. And this is urban flooding. So this is like in a in the city. This gentleman's trying to hold on to his car. <laughs> and when you get to the very end, if you look up at the top right, there's not much water up there, so this is all moving down there into that area. So the most common way a flash flood forms is when there's extreme rainfall from thunderstorms. It can also occur from slow moving of multiple thunderstorms, uh, sitting in the same spot. And then in Colorado, we're very prone to flash flooding. We have a lot of problem areas near Telluride, near Saw Pit. I don't know if you're familiar with that area, but we get a lot of mudslides, debris flows there. And then we obviously have problems in Eastern Utah as well. Those are the biggest ones. Megan's going to talk about winter. Well, I just think the girl from Louisiana is the expert on winter weather, right? I actually want to talk to you about this. So winter weather, that's been my biggest challenge for sure since coming out to this area, learning about winter weather and, you know, snow in general. Um, so winter weather, you know, we get so much of it here. We get, you know, snow. We even have ice storms like we had a couple of years ago. Jeff, I don't remember that well. Um, so we get some of the biggest snowstorms out here in the country. We get it anywhere from, you know, January when you're expecting it to the first day of summer when you're not expecting it. Um, so the danger is obviously winter storms. You can have the roofs collapsing, like he snow is so heavy, a big problem we had this year, if you guys remember, um, so many avalanches because that snow is just so wet and heavy and unstable. So we had a really big problem this year with avalanches. Um, we just went on a drive the other day to see the, um, was Lake City? Lake City um, avalanche. And that damage is just so impressive. It's basically like a burn scar, like a, um, all those trees are just completely gone. So yeah, that heavy wet snow, those avalanches can cause a lot of damage. Um, and this is just a picture of one of the storms that we had this year. So you guys know it was a great winter. Um, and we had upwards of three feet with this one storm. So 
And we already have snow coming back, unfortunately for me. Um, we got out of El Paso a couple weeks ago, so didn't even get three months off. So um, another winter threat that we have is <coughs> so um, basically, you know, we get you know when our things are melting and then they refreeze, and you have these large blocks of ice that are just starting to jam up the river. And this happened um, in Gunnison a little bit ago, I think three years ago or something like that. Um, so as a result of these ice jams, we have some flooding that we have to look out for. And, um, you know, a lot of times it's hard to predict these, and especially during the winter and stuff, you don't really think about an ice jam as being a threat or something like that. So it's hard for people to be situationally aware for this kind of thing. <laughs> so you can see just the, the flooding of water from this ice jam. you would have thought that it wasn't the middle of winter when that was happening. That looked like a summer, spring flash flood. So obviously if you're getting caught in that, hypothermia is gonna be a threat. That's really cold water that's happening and rushing through you. So yeah, ice jams are another big threat that we have to deal with out in our area. I guess I should let the I'm gonna talk about fire weather, huh? <laughs> so one of my my other job as lead is gonna be all just mostly this. I'm usually on wildfires. I was on the 416 fire in Durango last year for 14 days. And then um, I was up in Utah for another 14 days on the Dollar Ridge fire. So two big, high-profile fires in those areas. So the biggest thing for fire weather, there's not much we can do about it. I mean, it's going to happen, especially when we're going to drought situations, like last year where we didn't have any rain pretty much the whole summer. Extreme drought conditions were in place. The biggest things for you to be aware of is when we issue a fire weather watch, that means conditions are prime. The situation is there. We can see wildfires develop if a spark or ignition is provided. A red flag warning, warning basically means all the weather parameters are in place and the fuels are critically dry. So red flag warning means probably shouldn't be burning outside or doing any um, off-roading. So one of the big problems with wildfires is the aftermath. And in this situation, post-fire uh, landslide hazards become a problem and this was the 416 fire. And then you can see how the landscape just gets totally nuked. And what happens is the soils, the water can no longer absorb into the soils because they become what they, we call hydrophobic. So there's like a, the saps and resins from the trees deposit on the soils and it makes it impenetrable. So the water is like falling on asphalt, basically. So it just starts to run and picks up debris and mud. And this is that gentleman's backyard from the picture earlier and this was that day when it occurred the flooding and this the, the scary thing is it only takes about a quarter inch of rain to make this happen it's not like we need an inch of rain it's all about the rate we just had this in lake christine here we saw a few earlier this summer a quarter inch of rain in 15 minutes caused massive mud and debris flows to come crashing down the mountain so we put rain gauges in place around these burn scars and we work with our heart with the hydrologists and determine the criteria that each particular burning scar needs. Then we work with the emergency management teams to get a plan in place and escape routes with the community and the members that live around that area. So severe thunderstorms, everyone know the de definition of a severe thunderstorm because there is one. It has to have winds 58 miles an hour or greater. Why 58? Because it's really 50 knots. But since Americans haven't adopted the metric system fully, and anyway, hail this size can damage or hail one inch in diameter. When we were all growing up, it was three quarters of an inch, but we found that there was too many storms causing that and not a lot of damage. So then they got the size of the hailstone of one inch in diameter. So that's about the size of a quarter. So if a meteorologist calls you and asks you what size hail, don't say marble. Because how many different sized marbles are there? <laughs> so we like to throw out, to throw out a coin. It's dime size. It's 
any size vehicle, then we can figure out where we're going from there. So just handy, or in the case of Eastern Colorado, bigger than Salt Falls, which we had this year. Does everyone know we set the state record for the largest hailstone this past summer in Colorado? Almost five inches in diameter. We're supposed to get a 3D model of this hailstone so we can bring them to the shows. We haven't received it yet, but it's going to be the coolest thing. They're using those uh, plastic machines. <coughs> those 3D imaging things, yeah, those things. So thunderstorms can produce uh, tornadoes and dangerous lightning. Heavy rain can also lead to flash flooding. And the strong winds obviously are going to knock down trees and branches. And I know we had a case this, this summer in Montrose where we had some trees knocked down and flooding of roads with severe thunderstorms. So here's an example from Russia of how fast winds can come and go. And watch the time. It starts off at 33 seconds, 160033. Not much going on, little breeze, you can see the tree back there starting to move a little bit. And it's starting to pick up. <laughs> so now it's gonna get real fun here. So we're not even a minute, we're not yet to a minute. <laughs> so I'd probably estimate winds, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour, and she goes hopping away and we never see her again. And in one minute, it's gone, it's stopped. So just that fast, that's how fast these winds can come up and down. And we see that out here all the time with microburst winds. And that's a microburst is caused from rain falling from the sky. It evaporates before it hits the ground, so that's called verga. And then when it hits the ground, the air is moving down and it accelerates due to gravitational forces. And then we get those strong winds like that that last a minute that could do a lot of damage. So this is our other friend, large hail. So, you know, we luckily don't see a lot of that on the West Slope. We see usually pea size to dime, quarter sometimes. We have had baseball size hail on the West Slope near Rangeley, Colorado, that did a lot of damage. So it does happen, but it doesn't happen very often. <coughs> yeah, it happens. But we can get a lot of that pea size stuff that can wipe out a crop too, which is just as severe. So lightning, lightning moves within the cloud, between clouds or between the cloud and the ground. So we see a lot of this, lightning, the cool displays, but they're our fire starters. But did you know that most of our wildfires are started by humans, about 80%, it's kind of crazy. But lightning makes up for the rest of that too. As lightning passes through the air, it, it um, heats and a narrow channel of air, rapidly expands that air to about 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And You'll hear the expansion of the air. That's the shock wave, and that's when we hear the thunder as that pops. And that sound travels about a mile every five seconds. So that's all 1,001, 1,002. Kind of roughly give you an idea of how far away that thunderstorm is. So here's some more cool videos. <laughs> And I just got a brand new video from Montrose last week. I don't have them to show yet, but we did have a tree struck and a ring of fire around the house that falls through the cable. So yeah, the, the ocean liners aren't aren't immune to this. Good place or not? No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did he say? 
I don't know exactly what he said, but I think, I think he's from Scotland. So lightning is one of the leading causes of direct weather-related fatalities in the state of Colorado. Why would that be? Anyone have a guess? Anyone climb mountains in this place? We have a lot of people like to climb 14,000 foot mountains and they start too late in the day and they get up there and that's when it arrives and it doesn't look like much of a storm, but man, I've been up there. I've experienced that 14,000 foot crop hole lightning storm running for my life down the hill so I was a uh, 21 when I did that <laughs> I learned my lesson fast but yeah being outdoors is obviously the most dangerous place and we have a lot of outdoor opportunities in Western Slope so people are out there they're enjoying it just got to make sure you're aware of um, situational aware the only real safe place is inside a substantial building or a heart of your vehicle so that's the safest places to be during that. I'll let the planes girl talk about tornadoes. Yeah, so next up, uh, tornadoes, like Jeff said. Um, so obviously we don't get a lot of tornadoes out here, but um, like you said, we average about one a year. Um, but as you can tell, tornadoes are just basically a violently rotating column of air. It's picking up all this debris, it's picking up dirt, it's picking up rocks, houses, cows, if you've seen Twister. Um, it can pick up pretty much anything. Yeah, um, so basically like it picks all that stuff up, you know, and it hurls it out, it flings it out across anywhere. Um, so that's why it's so important to make sure you guys are inside and away from any sort of buildings and stuff like that, any sort of windows, because all this debris could just be flown into the house and damage and um, cause a lot of damage. And obviously they're going really fast. So we um, recently changed the EF scale back in 2007, so the enhanced Vegeta scale. And that's just how we rate the, um, the wind speeds or the wind gusts with the tornadoes to rate how strong they are. So it can get over 200 miles an hour with tornadoes. Um, most of our tornadoes that we see here are EF0 and 1s, um, but still wind speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour at times. And this is one of my favorite slides, um, the tornado myth busting, because we've heard it all as meteorologists. So um, we always hear that tornadoes don't hit big cities, but Salt Lake City is a pretty big city, as is Fort Worth, Texas, um, two instances right there. Um, people always say that tornadoes are just attracted to mobile homes, but that doesn't <laughs> matter at all. Um, and just unfortunately, you know, the damage is a lot more prevalent with them because they're not as, um, you know, they're not on the ground. Um, we also hear that tornadoes can't cross water. They can cross water. <laughs> um, and again, we hear that they can't travel in the mountains. Um, we had one on the Grand Mesa just a few years ago, so we can get them out here. And then finally, um, people always say that, you know, where I live, nothing ever happens. It always goes around me, just like that, um, <laughs> that little cartoon. But no, um, you're not protected from tornadoes. They can, as long as the conditions are right, they can form. So this is just kind of our climatology for tornadoes in our forecast area, so eastern Utah and western Colorado. Again, like Jeff mentioned, about one per year. Our last one was at EF0 up in Steamboat last summer. Um, and our prime time for getting them is usually as you would expect um, during the summertime, like during the monsoon season where we're getting our storms. And again, the bulk of us are EF0 and 1s, but we did have um, an EF2 that has occurred. So we get some tornadoes out here. And I guess the southern girl can talk about the hurricanes. Um, so obviously hurricanes, you know, they're those big destructive um, tropical systems that move through, wind speeds <coughs> over 100 miles an hour with these as well. Um, and we get the remnants of tropical systems. So that's the main thing that we want to talk about. So on the next slide, we actually have an instance that occurred um, back in 1911. So this occurred down in Southwest Colorado. And there was a pretty devastating, um, the remnants of a tropical system that came into the area. And it caused a lot of significant damage. You can see the damage to the roadway, or sorry, the railroad. Um, some major flooding that occurred. It occurred, um, it washed away a lot of bridges. It pretty much destroyed a bunch of the communications back in the day. And um, yeah, it occurred, it caused over $40 million based on today's standards for um, how much damage it caused. And I think just last year we had um, remnants of two systems, Bud and um, Rosa, that brought some flooding to our area. So we do get some hurricanes up here, remnants. <laughs> and so um, one of the last sections we want to talk about was kind of the situational awareness. So hit the next slide. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
anyone you know could relate to any of that. But um, <laughs> situational awareness is very important. Um, so one of the main things we always stress about is just first off knowing where you are. Um, so many times we'll ask people of, like they don't even know what county they live in or um, what their neighboring county is. And obviously, you know the weather's going to come from another county at one point. So it's good to know where you are and also where your other surrounding areas are. So you guys are in Montrose County. <laughs> um, so next up, um, another big thing in situational awareness is you know just getting all your information on a larger scale. So you know just a few days out, um, it's good a good time to just kind of look at the basic forecast. Um, what's the temperature going to be? Is it going hiking? Is it going to be raining? Is there any thunderstorms? Um, looking to see if there's any severe weather threat based on the Storm Prediction Center, just stuff like that. Um, a great way to get this information is using our websites. Um, we have, like Jeff mentioned, we have our own website, which we'll talk about next, but um, if you guys are on social media, we have both Facebook and Twitter. We post pretty regularly, and I know Montrose County um, retweets our stuff fairly regularly as well. So just making sure you can get your, our information um, from that. And then looking at our point click forecast, this is just an example of our homepage. Um, so you can either put your location up at the top left, or you can, um, sorry, top right, um, or you can just click on the map. And um, that will give you this next page, which basically just gives you the outlook for the next several days, um, either in graphical format or text. And um, it also gives you the current conditions at whatever the station is nearest to you. So this is a great thing to do several days in advance, just to get an eye up on what's happening. And then um, next step, situational awareness. So this can range anywhere from hours to days, but this is when things are getting a little bit closer to the event. Um, still monitoring those conditions, but during this time frame, this is when we could start to send out some of our products. So we have, you know, anything from on the day scale, we do our winter storm watches or our fire weather watches, and maybe on a more hourly scale, the severe thunderstorm watches or tornado watches. And during the watch, the main thing we want to stress to you guys is this just means that conditions are favorable for that hazardous weather to occur. So in this, in this step, you guys need to make sure you're just closely monitoring the weather, again, following our pages or looking at the forecast, um, and just making sure that you have your action plan in place so you're prepared if you need to take action. And then when it comes to anything from minutes to hours, um, this is when we have our warning stage, which means to take action. So on the hourly scale, uh, scale we have our tornado warnings, our super thunderstorms, those really um, or minutes, sorry, minutes. Uh, that's when that kind of information is coming out and the flash flood warnings. And then the longer scale things, the winter storm warning, red flag warnings, that's typically sent out, you know, within a day or so. And again, the warning, it just means that you guys need to take action because that hazardous weather is imminent or it's occurring at that moment. And so you guys already have your plans in place and are just ready to take that action whenever we see it. And um, this is just a radar graphic. So the red boxes, rainbow warnings, the yellow boxes would be the severe thunderstorm warnings. And um, this is just a quick overview about the different types of warnings that we can send out from our area. Again, like Jeff mentioned at the beginning, we are the only people um, able to send out these official warnings. So, um, severe thunderstorm warnings, whenever you have those winds in excess of 58 miles an hour greater, and the one inch hail. Tornado warnings, we can do it whenever we have a confirmed report of a tornado or whenever we see indications on our radar that there's rotation occurring. Flash flood warning, it can be anything from just a rapid rise of water that we think is enough of a threat to issue, or whenever you have six inches or more of flowing water over roadways. And then finally, um, winter storm warnings. So, um, so we're looking at changing some of our criteria based on you know, time scale and event driven and stuff like that, but overall we're expecting a lot of snow in a short amount of time. And um, finally, red flag warnings, Jeff already covered that. We have those critically, um, critical fire weather conditions. So there are a lot of different ways that you guys can monitor the weather. Um, so we have our radar, either you know, if you go on our website or other different apps that you guys can purchase um, to monitor the radar. We also have our, we don't have an app per se, but we do have a widget, I think it's called. You can just um, automatically link to our forecast or your location. And then social media, again, is a great way to get that information. But the one thing that we really just stress to people is that it's really great to have multiple ways to receive this information because things break. <laughs> and we know that very well in our industry. Things break, and it's great to have a lot of different ways to receive something instead of relying on one method of communication. So it's great to have your options open, and there's a lot of options available. Um, something that you guys are all probably already 
on top um, on track with already is the wireless emergency alerts. So this is already based on your phone. Um, so based on your cell phone provider. Um, this is the same system that sends out those Amber Alerts and um, stuff like that. So it's based on your GPS. And so if you're driving on the road and uh, you all of a sudden drive into an area that might have a severe thunderstorm warning, you'll get an alert on your phone. So we definitely just recommend that you guys don't turn this off because um, it's just really great for making sure that based on your location, this is the weather threat that's occurring. And then finally, um, just some other warning methods you can get. Uh, we have the no weather radio, if any of you guys have that. It's a great tool for, um, it's constantly broadcasting what the current forecast is, and if there is one of those hazardous conditions occurring, like a tornado warning or severe thunderstorm warning, it's gonna automatically beep at you, and it's gonna let you know. And then we're all familiar with, you know, watching the TV weathermen, um, or just the news, it'll have that scrolling bar that says the severe thunderstorm warnings in effect, stuff like that. Um, and then finally, if you're, this doesn't really happen in our area, but further out east, they have the sirens that they send out for outdoors. Another All right, we're almost done, I promise. So, flash flood safety, just real quick. The biggest thing is you need to stay informed, get, obviously know where you're at. If the flash flood warning is issued, you wanna to move to higher ground immediately. Obey any evacuation orders that are coming across. Practice uh, electrical safety, so don't, don't go uh, into the basement as it could flood. That would not be a good spot. Um, avoid flood waters at all costs. So it doesn't take much water to move a vehicle. Um, we have some other slides that are in our spotter training talks that kind of shows just six to 12 inches of water will float away a lot of vehicles. Even those big trucks that have the big buoyant tires, they like to float a little bit. So. Um, winter weather safety. Each year, more than 6,000 people are killed, and over 480,000 people are injured due to weather related vehicle crashes. And it's often really exciting when you're driving home from Denver or going over Vail Pass, and this guy from Indiana goes blowing by you, and the road's covered in snow. and you know, I'm like thinking, I'll see this guy in a few more minutes. And yeah, about five minutes later, he's upside down on his roof. And I've seen that happen twice now. Just get going too fast for the conditions. If you do need to drive in the snow or cold beach, just slow it down, take your time. Fire weather safety, make sure you have an emergency kit ready to take with you if you're evacuated. Follow all instructions by local officials. If you're not ordered to evacuate, um, just don't light campfires. Try to avoid adding to the problem. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is one of the leading causes of death after storms because uh, power outages are going on and the gas is still flowing. And so portable generators, people bring them in their houses. And we see this a lot with the hurricane back ends on that. Severe thunderstorm safety. When you're at home, stay in a secure location. If you're at a workplace or school, stay away from the windows. If you're outside, go inside. <clears throat> when thunder roars, you go. This is a test. <laughs> when thunder roars, you go. Under a tree. Indoors, yes. <laughs> All the kids know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those kids are something. In a vehicle. Uh, being in a vehicle during a tornado obviously not safe. You want to get to the closest shelter. Standing underneath a overpass is not exactly the safest place either. I've seen overpasses get dislodged and collapse. So you just need to make sure you can get in a secure location that you feel safe. And obviously, the lower the better with a tornado, but then you've got to watch that risk for flooding. So you just, just have to be situationally aware. But be sure you know where you're going. And then tornado. Oh, no, that's good. Winter outlet. This is what we're all here for. I'll have, I'm going to preface this by saying this is not my forecast. <laughs> I'm an operational meteorologist, so we deal in the, the now to 10 years <coughs> out. The Climate Prediction Center, these are the scientists that are looking at the long range forecast. So the next three, six, 12 months down the line. So this is our outlook for November, December, and January. And it's, most people say, see this big, Red areas say above normal temperatures. This is temperatures on the left. 
precipitation on the right. But it doesn't actually mean that. It does and it doesn't. This is the confusing part. So let's pretend we have a dartboard up here. And the dartboard's divided into 33% squares, or wedges. So when we say there's a 50% chance of above normal temperatures, we're expanding that 33% to 50%. But the other two wedges will get smaller. So then when you take your dart and you throw it out the board, you have a better chance of being above normal than you do below normal. So odds are favoring above normal temperatures. It doesn't mean we're going to be above normal the whole winter. There'll be periods of hot, cold, that will go back and forth. Same with the precipitation, very similar. Use that dartboard analogy, throw it out the board, and see where you get. But their odds are favoring at least a wet start to the winter. Um, I do believe October we might turn the rain on. That's my plan anyway. So then January, February, March for the second half of winter, which is typically what we would see in the West. Um, kind of still odds favoring a little bit warmer than normal and then equal chances that means no strong signal for precipitation. And typically in the West, we hear things like El Nino and La Nina. Right now we're in what we call the no Nino stage. There's no signal in the tropics, so that's not really a factor. So the winter is looking kind of normal, whatever normal is. Because <laughs> normal is just a measure of extremes. You put all these extremes together and then you get a normal curve. So obviously we're either gonna be up, down, low, or sideways, but odds are favoring a wetter start to the winter followed by drying out a little bit. And then El Nino is supposed to come back next March. So that could change things. We'll see. And that, is all we got. So we'd love to take any questions. Okay, who has questions? It's a two-pronged question. One, the Weather Channel. Do they get their information from you and how accurate is the Weather Channel? Many of them watch. They do get their information from us. They have their own team of meteorologists. And as far as their accuracy, I don't know because I don't watch them anymore. So I, I, since I was like Megan, when I was a wee little one, it was 24-7 weather channel, it drove my dad nuts because I just had to watch the weather channel. As far as their accuracy, I can't say one way or the other. I think we're all pretty good. What's the difference between an advisory and a warning? All right. Warnings will have higher criteria, basically. So an advisory is less intense, less of an impact, so not as significant. Um, in the case of a winter storm advisory or winter weather advisory, we're only forecasting three to six inches of snow, but if we go into a warning, it'll be six inches or more. So it's just the criteria is higher. There's actually talk discussions about eliminating the word advisory because it is a confusing term and maybe go into more of a snow alert or a weather alert or, or something along that line. We're working with a lot of social scientists on this and trying to hammer through it. We have a predict in the next five years, the term advisory is gonna be gone, and we'll have something new in place. But the warnings are always gonna stay there. So if you hear the warning, stay indoors. Okay. Uh, question is, uh, two questions. One is how do you send up uh, weather balloons and send them back, bring them back down without hitting airplanes? First question. All right, so every day, we, uh, I'll let Megan, she's a weather. <laughs> I the balloon. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we actually talk to the airport, we call them as soon as we send it up, and we say, um, are we good to launch? And I think they've only told us no, like once, and I think that was because Air Force One was coming in. So um, that was a good reason us to do it. Um, and then the only time we don't send a weather balloon up is if there's something because we're carrying a big tall object and we don't want to get struck. But otherwise, we're setting it up even when it's pouring down rain. We have like an hour and a half time window to send it up. So. You said that there's uh, one weather station here in Montrose. On my iPhone, I have two different Montroses that give two different uh, temperatures. They're similar, but 
are there two different stations, or what's it picking up on my iPhone? So what I was referencing um, at the beginning, that was the station that we have at the airport. Um, there are also other kinds of sensors that they have, and people have their own weather stations. Um, we have various, what they're called, I think there's some of that. Yeah, so we have some other um, different networks that we use, but the one that we maintain is at the airport. Um, so depending on where your location is in town, it'll ping whatever one is closest. Oh. But we maintain the one at the airport. So I spend a lot of time in uh, the Lake City area and the Alpine Plateau in the summer. Is that part of your shadow that you're seeing from Delta? Is that part of your pie? Because it never is right. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard area to get a forecast or any actual data. I'm just wondering if that's why. And that's why weather spotters are so important. <laughs> so we really rely heavily on people in this area, um, especially coming from somewhere further, po like more um, densely populated out east, to coming out here where you know we're a lot more spread out, and there's obviously the mountains, and no one wants to live up at 14,000 feet. Um, so we really rely heavily on spotters out here because we can only see so much from our our office, and obviously we're definitely challenged here. Um, satellite has made things a lot better in terms of being able to see those challenging areas. Um, but we rely so heavily on observations. So if you see anything, please call us. If, you know, if there's a pretty good looking storm and you think we should be looking at it a bit more closely, definitely give us a call, you know, if it's three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so we rely so heavily on observations and, you know, we do the best of what we can, but um, there's always more to learn for sure. Really interesting. Yeah. Okay, last question. Well, thank you very much for an uh, informative and uh, very entertaining talk. Um, I'm interested in, in how, um, weather models that you base your work on, the computer models, relate to climate models that we hear so much about? Okay, so the, the weather models, we're, we're looking at the now, we're climate, we're looking at future. So the models are totally separated. They're totally two different types of computer modeling systems. I don't know a lot about the climate prediction models that we're using because I'm in daily daily business, but I know they're continuously being adjusted and uh, updated. Our, our daily operational models, the weather models that we're looking at, are still constantly being updated daily. Um, we're making tweaks and adjustments, and as those mathematics, as we can do more for mathematics with the computers, we're able to fine tune them even further. So I, I can't really comment on the climate prediction models that much outside of that they're looking Decad decadal processes versus the now. Let's have another thank you for Jeff and Mary.